It's Monday. It's July 31st. And the word of the day is thunderplumped, which means to be soaked all the way through your clothes in seconds by a heavy downpour of rain. Used in a sentence, I'm pretty sure thunderplumped is also a sex thing, like puzzle in a thunderstorm. Yeah, at the very least, it'll make you slippery for when the goat gets there. Yep. Oh, yeah. you're into goat stuff. I didn't realize you were pansexual. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, perfect, it was perfect, either a joke perfect. about your fucking kids. I chose the be- I chose the right route, yeah, is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, much appreciated. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Michael Marshall. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from the new world and the old world, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, aliens are real. Rishi Sunak falls narrowly short of being the biggest loser in half a century. <laughs> and after his My Pillow Garage sale, Mike Lindell's net worth remains at approximately negative $1.3 billion. <laughs> <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, before we get started, I'm thinking we fire up a weirdly aggressive argument on the internet. Do you actively wash your feet in the shower? Oh, I'm always so worried about giving like the wrong answer that people will judge in these situations. Yeah, so right, I just right. never shower to be safe. Oh, there you go. Nailed it. <laughs> and like, no, it's fine, right? Because your feet just get washed automatically if you use them to wash the rest of your body rather than using your hands. Uh, <laughs> it, it takes a bit of practice and some flexibility, but it's, it's a complete time saver once you've perfected it. That is genius, actually. <laughs> I am probably going to hurt myself trying to learn that. Okay. In our lead story tonight. The race for the Republican nomination in next year's presidential election is heating up. And what we're seeing now is Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis and all the other insane GOP candidates playing a game called what's the perfect happy medium of bigotry to get Republican votes. And it looks like Ron DeSantis decided to draw his line after slavery had pros and cons, that being part of the public school history curriculum. He's good with that. But he's drawing his line before literal Nazi imagery in his ads. It's a, it's a weird line. It's a I weird mean, line. He's drawing his line before that now, Heath. He's going to have something to ramp up to. You know? <laughs> well, it's either that or maybe he's just worried about like infringing the Nazis' copyright. Because I think he's on like two strikes already from YouTube and he does not want to lose his channel. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's fair. That'd be trouble. Got to go to Rumble. Yeah. So a big thanks to Karen for the link. And also, sorry about your name, getting turned into a synonym for Lady Nazi. That's got to (laughs) suck. Skepticratnews at gmail.com if you want to help out. So I'll start with the literal neo-Nazi who was working for the Ron DeSantis campaign. His name is Nate Hockman. And (laughs) and also Ron DeSantis, I guess. No, his name is Nate Hockman. (laughs) And he looks like a... Uh, Like a recessive gene just bubbled out into a human body like an amoeba somehow, but with multiple cells. Like, whiter than me and more recessive than me. Not good. Like, he should not be a white supremacist. He knows better than anybody that we are in last place, if any place. But that didn't stop him from creating a Ron DeSantis video featuring the Sonnenrad symbol. That's the lightning bolt sunwheel thing that Heinrich Himmler literally installed in the headquarters of the SS inside a Nazi castle. Yeah, I inserted a picture of Nate Hockman in our notes, and he looks like he just said, may I say you're looking and smelling very fertile today, my dear. (laughs) It somehow does look like that. (laughs) So, after creating the video, Hockman arranged to have it posted on Twitter by an outside account, and then he retweeted the video himself on his account. And then he tried to pretend he just found the video by chance and he had no idea about that imagery being a Nazi thing. But then he got caught in a lie by Axios and he got fired by the campaign for getting caught being a neo-Nazi, to be clear. Not for being one in the first place, which they very easily could have known. Yeah, I mean, I mean this genuinely Where the fuck do you draw that line in the DeSantis campaign? (laughs) It's tricky, right? But I I actually think this is a good move by DeSantis because you obviously want the Nazis who are smart enough to not get caught. But if that is what he's going for, he needs to focus more as recruiting on like Argentina or Chile. There's plenty Mm -hmm. of them there. Or, you know, the the center of the hollow earth where all those Nazis hang out. Yeah, there you go. George Santos. (laughs) No, he's getting caught now. All right, well, that brings us to the new curriculum for black history in Florida public schools. This really happened. 
the state's Board of Education officially approved new guidelines last week that align with the Stop Woke Act of 2022 that Ron DeSantis championed. In terms of black history, that made it illegal for teachers to take sides on topics of race, like, for example, the question, are we pro-slavery or anti-slavery in retrospect? You can't take sides on that. You have to be balanced. The new curriculum presents both sides in a fair and balanced way so we can get a nuanced understanding of human bondage pro or con. In particular, one of the new talking points on the pro-slavery side is about the important educational opportunity that was made available to people who were enslaved. Students in Florida are going to be taught that slavery gave its victims, quote, personal benefit because they, quote, developed skills. You're welcome, <laughs> slaves, I guess. Sorry, one second, Heath. Hi, yes, I'd like to enroll in Florida public schools. Yeah, no, uh, specific request. I'd like to be there just for the first day a white teacher says that to a class of black students. <laughs> <laughs> You're all full up? Okay, no, full? no, I understand. Yeah, I understand. yeah, yeah they were yeah, full. No, they were full. But slavery was an education. Like, what, learn what a cat of nine tails feels like and develop enduring torture skills. Just remember, every atrocity is just a learning opportunity in Florida. Ah, uh, this is job creators. Great, yeah, so... We'll see how it goes for DeSantis in the polling. Maybe he found that Goldilocks zone of hating stuff to get those Republican primary voters. And if not, there's a whole field of candidates creating their insane D&D &D characters with a list of phobia scores of their bigotry instead of character traits. That's the GOP <laughs> field now. All right, well, I think we're gonna need a quick break for a word from our sponsor, Policy Genius. Hey, podcast listener, if you don't listen to Marsha's other shows, you might not be aware that starting this month, our very own Michael Marshall quit his corporate job and is now solely a skeptical activist. That's right. And that, of course, means that he is poor now. Poor indeed, Heath. Poor indeed. Uh, hey! But just because Marsh now scrounges up his meager meals of porridge and Habernasher with whatever the skeptical community leaves him doesn't mean when he dies he needs to leave his family as destitute as he was in life. That's why there's Policy Genius. I am not destitute. Look, I, I just got this jumper. Policy Genius knows how valuable your time is. That's why their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for $1 million worth of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Plus, Policy Genius has licensed award-winning agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. They work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. Policy Genius is for parents, caregivers, and anyone else who has people who depend on them. They simplify the process of getting life insurance so you can protect the people you love. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. It's true. As our regular listeners might remember, I went through quite the ordeal to get life insurance a few years ago, but knowing I've got security for my loved ones is absolutely worth the money. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net, and you deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to PolicyGenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's PolicyGenius.com. Policy Genius. Don't leave your loved ones as poor as Michael Marshall. Love this jumper. And we're back. Next up in headlines in Close Encounters of the Word Kind News, skeptical activist Michael Marshall and also all of physics are looking pretty silly right now because a <laughs> very reliable witness testified before Congress this week that aliens are real. That's right. We've captured their spacecraft and even have their bodies. And how do we know all this? Because he knows a guy who saw it. So you know it's true. I feel like Eli's being sarcastic. I don't like what's going to happen right now. I'm going to look stupid. <laughs> so, I, so they went to Congress with the same standard of evidence that you use on citation needed essays. That is a bold <laughs> choice. Yeah. 
Okay, but now a top expert in the U.S. covert cartography department is saying that Finland actually doesn't exist and we've known for decades. I feel like that's the analogy and this is real. Mm. I feel like this is is real. real. (laughs) I feel like, again, that I'm going to be made to look stupid, but in my heart, I think it's real. (laughs) Okay. Well, so as many of you have seen on your dumbest friend's Facebook wall, uh, the liar in question is former Air Force and intelligence official David Grush, who testified that Men in Black was a documentary back in June and assured us this past week that he was super duper serial. So you might ask yourself, what makes Grush different than the millions of other wackos throughout history who have assured us with the utmost seriousness that aliens are real? and that the government is hiding them. It's not his credibility. He's significantly lower ranking than the other folks who have made this claim. Uh, It's not his evidence because he doesn't have any. Uh, It's the fact that he's testifying before the dumbest fucking Congress in history since beating each other to death with sticks was a viable form of political debate. That's what the difference is. Okay, but physicists and astronomers called the testimony potentially even credible eli that was in the article those exact words that's right like, you guys are in on it you you and marsh are in on big <laughs> there are aliens maybe so there are two clarifications worth making about this story the first is that there are very real revelations of unidentified flying objects that are often lumped in with aliens taking place right, right now right and unidentified flying objects are just Things that we don't know what they are. Raindrops near cameras. Bugs at an angle. Hoaxers. Those are all unidentified flying objects. Their unidentifiableness is as real as aliens are not. (laughs) And that is always a thing that bugs me like the most about UFO believers. You can't say it's an unidentified flying object. And therefore, I know what it is. Like, it's unidentifiableness <laughs> can't be evidence that it's the thing you're identifying it as. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> okay, I, uh, I have no follow-up right now. I have no follow-up to that. <laughs> Think Go. On it. Think on it. And second is... Hold and, on. No, I didn't have it. Go. <laughs> and second, and, and this doesn't get talked about enough, this kind of thing, right? Aliens crashed in spaceships and we have their bodies. It's... As far as we know, literally physically impossible, right? Look, this has been explained better other places, but we've looked really far with telescopes. If there were an alien civilization capable of space flight, we'd have seen them. And since we haven't, that means any aliens that visit Earth would have to be somehow invisible to us or capable of intergalactic travel, which, as far as we understand it right now, defies the laws of physics. Right, exactly. And the thing is, even if they were here, they probably would have come in sort of similar looking crafts. So the fact that there's such a wide range of fuzzy shapes that people claim are spaceships is either evidence that they're not spaceships or it's... Evidence that dozens of different alien species all just happened to get to Earth around the same time. Like this planet was that cute little neighborhood they all just decided to gentrify. It's one of those two Um, things. (laughs) Okay, well, that's a trend we know about in, you know, real estate marsh. And also, I would like to point out that it's also possible that the aliens came all in one shape of craft. And they also brought decoy shapes of crafts as the perfect smoke screen and now they wait exactly <laughs> to profit yeah. or something fuck it's not working my thing's not working so for those of you wondering uh the options now are that either someone was messing with this dude or all of physics has just gotten lucky up to this point about being correct <laughs> about things either way People like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert are going to ask questions in these hearings, and oh. I can't <laughs> wait for yes. it. I'm here for it, everybody. And in time to say goodbye election news, um, <laughs> there are few sweeter sounds than the long, drawn-out death rattle of the Conservative Party as it coughs and splutters its way into obsolescence at the next general election. <laughs> and last week, we were lucky enough to hear not just one rendition of that death rattle, but a full reprise and an encore. Because I'm talking about the three (laughs) by-elections that took place uh, on July 20th, which resulted in a humiliating and historic defeat for the party in government. I don't know, Marsh. I find 
British elections hard to follow for the same reason I find Major League Baseball here to follow here in the United States. There's 162 matches a season. They're super boring <laughs> unless something terrible happens. It's fair. It's fair. Okay. But Rishi Sunak is the Jackie Robinson of UK prime ministers. I feel like you're being super negative, Eli, <laughs> about baseball and this, right? So first UK prime minister of color. Isn't that a big deal? Aren't we happy about that? Uh, no? I mean, yeah, I guess. But I think every single person of color in Britain would have preferred it was anybody else, essentially. He's sort Except, of like the default choice. Including yeah. Rishi Shunak. Oh, God, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So maybe not the best example of Jackie <laughs> Robinson. Okay. So a bit, bit, of, bit of background here. Um, when a member of parliament resigns or has to leave office outside of a general election, we hold a special election to replace them. Um, they, they could actually even stand at that election. For example, if their seat has gone to public review because they got found in breach of ministerial st standards, they could say, well, I think I'm still the person for the job and run for that election. Um, here in the UK, those midterm elections are called by-elections uh, because they could go either way and because conservatives would prefer that they didn't exist in the first place. Oh, well, if that's the convention, they should name them poor people elections because then. Right. It's clear. <laughs> but the thing is, they do exist. And on July 20th, we <laughs> saw three all at once. There was the Somerset and Froome election, which was up for debate after the Tory MP was suspended over allegations of sexual harassment and after being photographed pausing next to a very obvious pile of cocaine. <laughs> okay. He looks like he's about to say in this photo. You didn't get the cocaine in the shot, did you? <laughs> <laughs> On this giant lasagna pan. That I, I know! <laughs> it's so weird. Yeah, he clearly thought it was maybe going to get cut out, and then he was like, oh, it was in. I like to make fresh pasta from flour on the back of this giant lasagna pan. <laughs> this is where the best surface for pasta <laughs> so that seat in Somerset and Froome was won by the Liberal Democrats, with the Tories losing 26,000 seats, or 29% of their support in the process. Um, that is the 10th largest majority overturned in the history of UK by-elections right there. Okay, I'm keeping track. Uh, destroying economy by severing European membership? Yes. Cocaine? No. It's good to know where Britain's priorities <laughs> yeah, are. Okay, they found a line. Okay. For me, though, I'm just angry about the whiskey that he ruined with fucking crushed ice in this picture. That bothers me more than anything oh, else. Oh, yeah, he needs sacking for that that alone, absolutely. He's going to put Horrible. in a ninja cremini in a second. <laughs> So that was the first election. And then there was the Selby and Ernstie uh, by election, which went up for election when the Tory MP Nigel Adams resigned because Boris Johnson didn't give him a peerage in the resignation honours list that Johnson did when he left office. So because Adams wasn't given the position of power for life that he felt he just deserved, he decided to take his ball and go home in a move that would be so childish and ridiculed. It would be like ridiculed by literally any child around. And it essentially was ridiculed by a child, given that the Labour candidate who won the seat is 25. Keir Mather is now the youngest MP in the House of Commons. He's 25. Nice. He won the seat with 46% of the vote. Um, that is the sixth largest majority overturned in the history of UK by-elections. Okay, it's kind of like he tried to take his ball and go home, but it's like, like he tried to mime that he was taking the ball and going home. And everybody's <laughs> like, you're miming. That's... That's nothing. And also, we own this field now, is what's yeah. the consequence of this. <laughs> Idiot. So, given that that's the sixth biggest overturning of all time, there's only been five by-elections in all of history where a bigger majority has been overturned. And two of those were the 2021 North Shropshire election, where the Lib Dems took the seat away from disgraced Tory MP Owen Paterson, and the 2022 Tiverton and Honiton by-election, where the Lib Dems took the seat from Neil Parrish, <laughs> the Tory MP who got sacked for repeatedly watching porn in the House of Commons. That means four of the biggest, like the 10 biggest defeats of all time in all of history have been under this current government. And that's not even mentioning the 2022 Wakefield by-election, which Labour won after the Tory MP Imran Khan was convicted of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy. Okay, maybe it just took you guys a couple thousand years to take an election called Tiverton and Honiton. Seriously, Mark. <laughs> I mean, I know how long it would take me, and it's a couple thousand years, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> okay, he said North Shropshire, and yep, then he said North those two Shropshire. words. I started laughing. I felt like Marsh was genuinely just making up British words and seeing how far he could escalate <laughs> before we were like, come on, are you just making up noises that are British-y? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I've never heard of Tiverton before either. There's parts of this country <laughs> okay. that do not matter, and Tiverton, I think, must be one of them. Um, 
still, all of this, it, it wasn't all bad news for Rishi Sunak because there was a third by-election on July 20th, which was the Uxbridge and South Ryslip uh, election, which was a seat that was up for grabs after the... It's a real place. It's a real place. It's near London. It it's right near London. From um, Hampshire, Hampshire, Hampshire. <laughs> Look, we, I live in a country where we have more than five different names for places. It's not like Springfield, every fucking third village you go to, okay? We, we have a bit more invention. Oh, you know, that. that would be silly, Marsh. <laughs> <laughs> but also, oh, Uxbridge and South Rice, that's a seat that was up for grabs after the in- incumbent MP decided to quit rather than serve a three-month ban or suspension for serious violations of parliamentary ethics. Um, that previous MP was the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who was the person in charge <laughs> when is. every one of the by-elections that I've mentioned so far had to be called. He was there overseeing the reason all of these had to be called. Wow. Your government is getting more and more like playing a board game with Heath by the second, Marsh, just so you know. Like <laughs> okay, double fucking stamp and a triple get stamp. Get good. Whatever. <laughs> If so, I chop your hands off with scissors, that beats rock. That's just you know, how you can't play. I won. So, Make a rule about it then. Rishi Sunak's Tory party went at the Uxbridge by-election with the prospect of Sunak being the first prime minister to lose three by-elections on the same day for 50 years, since like 1973, something like that. Um, but the good news is for Rishi that his candidate actually won in Uxbridge. Um, the less good news is that they managed to turn a 15% lead that they had under Johnson into a 1.5% lead. They won by 495 votes, which is not a lot of winning margin. It's so slim. And ah, to be honest, I actually prefer it this way. Because the thing is, if, if Sunak had lost all three, he'd have ducked out of all the interviews, he'd have hidden from any scrutiny, we would never have seen him. But he was actually in Uxbridge for the results here. And because he won, we, he had to like give an interview, which was the most dead behind the eye celebratory speech you've ever seen <laughs> about how delighted he was to have been like fewer than one QED's worth of voters away from being the most disastrous prime minister in half a century. <laughs> so... Until we get to see Sunak firmly destroyed at a general election, I'll take being able to watch him having to grit his teeth and pretend that being crushed to an almost but not quite historic level is actually constituting a victory. Yeah, in America, we call that Republicans since 2016. I'm sure they've heard of it over there. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a winning tactic for sure. All right, next up in headlines, we have a quick follow-up on a very important story from our last episode. You might remember how Mike Lindell and his My Pillow company lost all their big retailers because of the woke mob. So first of all, <laughs> congrats again to the woke mob. Great job. According to Lindell, you cost him about $100 million after you, quote, did a cancel culture on did him. Did a cancel culture on him. <laughs> yep. And as a result, he had to sell off a bunch of equipment from the My Pillow headquarters and warehouses. Well, the auction happened last week, and it went so very badly. Just okay. really, really badly It would have gone way less badly if you and Noah hadn't confiscated my company card at the Detroit show, Heath. That's all I'm saying, okay? <laughs> okay, how many more times, Eli, you finish the meth that's on your plate before you go to buy more? That's the rule. <laughs> yeah, it's always been the rule. Thank you. <laughs> and a big thanks to Nick for the link on this one, skepticratnews at gmail.com. I'm guessing that Nick, like me, has an alert for... Mike Lindell weeping and a few other similar phrases. But somehow I missed this one. Great job, Nick, for catching it. So Lindell tried to auction off 854 items and it went so badly that not doing the auction at all would have been much better for the company. For example, <laughs> two very large power belt conveyors. I don't know exactly what that is, but they're big and expensive. They normally sell used for like orders of magnitude above the $6 each that he got because he's an <laughs> idiot who forgot to set reserve prices on anything. Oh, amazing. So, so good. good. The most successful items were a laptop and two sets of chairs that got no bids at all and therefore did not represent a very large loss. I'm sorry, Heath. We could have bought Mike Lindell's laptop. I t I wanted to go to Crazy. Minnesota with you. You think that guy knows how to erase a laptop? He probably just unplugged <laughs> it while telling it about the rabbits. He 
We could be we in really, the news. We really should have gone. Fuck. That's exactly it, right? Because like, the chair's going unclaimed. Okay, I get that. This is the my pillow guy. Those chairs are going to be a, about as comfortable as sitting hemorrhoid first on a washing machine on spin cycle. So yeah, no one wants those chairs. But how did nobody bid on the laptop when every right winger has been yelling about Hunter's laptop with every other breath they've taken <laughs> exactly. in the last five years or whatever? This is why the left loses elections. We're just not opportunistic enough. Ah, oh, we should have canceled the Detroit show and just gone. <laughs> Yes. We should have been opportunity. Send someone. <laughs> All right. And just one other follow up on Lindell from last time. He currently owes $5 million from one lawsuit about his big lie campaign and $1.3 billion from another lawsuit. But he explained a couple weeks ago that he's going to end up being vindicated about all that stuff. Just like in, you remember the motion picture, My Cousin Vinny? There was a vindication <laughs> just like that, according to Lindell. Well, apparently, that big vindication is going to happen at his upcoming event. He's teaming up with a bunch of QAnon lunatics, and they're doing an election summit that's going to prove that Biden lost in 2020 and also unveil a brand new something. <laughs> According to Lindell, quote, Eli, do you want to do the Mike Lindell quote, actually? Oh, yeah. Okay, let me do this. I got it. I'm hosting an event that will reveal the plan that will save our election platforms immediately. It's something that's never been done before in history or ever, even ever talked about. <laughs> exact this, quote. <laughs> this plan has been worked on for over a year and will be revealed to the world at the election summit on August 16th and 17th. This event will be live streamed on frankspeech.com. <laughs> Uh, and I just want to say, I'm going to call it right now. He's going to ask everyone in America to whisper their vote in his ear. That's what. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is the plan. In case he can't make it. And in raise the roof or news, um, as a guy named Michael, <laughs> who is the editor of a magazine called Skeptic, I occasionally have to clarify a few things to the casual reader. For example, the Skeptic in the UK that I edit is not affiliated to Skeptic magazine, which is run by Michael Shermer. Different Michaels. Um, the way you can tell those two publications apart is that my magazine will never do a sympathetic interview with a professional propagandist and Ken Doll from the Dark Dimension, Chris Rufo, which is exactly what Shermer did last week. <laughs> yeah. What I want to know is, do you ever get angry cancellations because they saw Shermer and your magazine has the cuckish, unmitigated gall to be about skepticism? <laughs> <laughs> Also, who the fuck is Michael Shermer? <laughs> <laughs> now, so you, you might be willing to give Shermer the benefit of the doubt here. Um, sometimes it's a good thing when people called Michael, who edit magazines called Skeptic, interview people who are comprehensively wrong about things. <laughs> um, I know why you might think that. But no, in this case, the interview was just so Shermer and Reefall could agree that, yes, critical race theory is destroying America and trans people are ick and the radical left really do control everything, as the, the ceaseless and unbroken advances in the rights of women and people of colour obviously prove. Yeah, at this point, Michael has asked us to give him the benefit of the doubt so many times. His very existence is a skepticism test at this point. Yeah, he's purely hypothetical by this right, point. Yeah, exactly. completely. <laughs> Does so, he have a podcast or something? Who the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> so, Sherman mentions early in this interview that he doesn't know very much about Rufo, um, which, you know, should be taken as a damning admission, given that he's the one choosing to interview him. Um, but it also might explain why, when they're talking about how Disney shouldn't force homosexuality 101 onto the Floridian kindergarten curriculum or whatever bullshit they think is happening. Um, Shermer brought up creationism as an example of something that he and Rufo agree shouldn't be pushed into the curriculum. Oh, buddy, I feel like that's going to go badly and mm. Rufo's not going to agree. You got to get the temperature of the room with like a few slur words before you jump right in with the atheism and embarrass yourself and your guest like that. Come yeah, on, man. Exactly, because just to be clear, because clearly the editor of Skeptic Magazine for the last three decades does not know this, Chris Rufo made his name as one of the directors at the Discovery Institute. That is <laughs> the creationist organization in America. <laughs> the, the one who was pushing the creationist textbooks in schools in the first place. They invented Teach the Controversy and Intelligent Design. They came out of the Discovery Institute. They, they actually published, the Discovery Institute published the book, which was the reason for the Kitzmiller versus Dover court case in the fucking first place. And Chris Rufo worked with the Discovery Institute as recently as 2021. 
which is when he ostensibly left there to start his suspiciously well-funded campaign against critical race theory, trans people, and all the things the Discovery Institute and their funders happen to dislike, you know, just coincidentally. Yeah, but an artist is never as popular with their solo stuff. I mean, we've all seen this story before, right? <laughs> I don't know. I love your blog, Eli. Oh. How dare you? How dare, you're dead <laughs> to me. Like your blog. Like, <laughs> look, like it really is something for the editor of Skeptic Magazine to promote and praise a literal creationist propagandist. Like, Chris Rufo was the film director for the Discovery Institute. He literally was, like, head of propaganda there. And to, for him, for Shermer to praise him and promote him and think it's not even worth mentioning in passing who Rufo even is to the audience, you know? Clearly, whatever level of research Shermer did into Rufo, it started and ended with, cool, he agrees with me about the woke, so he must be worth supporting, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I think he probably just reverse image searches anti-Semitic cartoons in someone's <laughs> mentions and then goes from there at this point. Okay, so Himmler, Sunwheel thing, to Ron DeSantis, obviously, mm -hmm. literally to Chris Rufo getting appointed to the board at New College of Florida by Ron DeSantis earlier this year. Yep. Seriously, back to anti-Semitic bacon in two steps. <laughs> That's real just now. It is, yeah, yeah. So this kind of bullshit is an embarrassment to the word skeptic. Um, that and the fact that Shermer has recently been claiming that conspiracy theories are actually a good thing, because real conspiracies do actually exist sometimes, um, so conspiracy theories are good. So, you know, Shermer has been making kissy faces at conspiracists and their audience for a while now. Still, he seems to only have gone as far as making kissy faces, so I guess that constitutes personal growth, at least. <laughs> oh, that's a wonderfully legal way to say Michael Shermer is well done. So there are magazines out there called Skeptic, edited by guys called Michael, um, where you won't be unknowingly and uncritically presented with creationist propagandists with zero pushback. So if actual skepticism is what you're after, rather than blinkered and partisan hackery, you might want to give that magazine, the UK one, a Google. Absolutely. The real one. <laughs> and in all my exes work like Texas news. If Elon Musk's insane policy changes and massive layoffs were his attempt to kill Twitter, this week can only be categorized as a post-mortem mutilation, as Musk's attempt to turn the website's name from Twitter to X <laughs> failed so miserably in every possible fucking way that it could. Yeah, no, I, I get it. You can't be accused of tanking Twitter if there is no Twitter. You know, he's, he's so smart, it's four-dimensional chess. <laughs> Okay, but the Tesla model Twitter is kind of tanking too, Marsh. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he's got a plan. Yeah, I'm sure he's got a plan. Because four-dimensional chess. He's a genius. Yeah. Okay. Now, I want to say at the outset that what I'm about to tell you is just a tiny fraction of the bad shittery that went down, and I'm sure will go down before mm. I finish saying these words and you download the podcast. But <laughs> I could truly have taken up our entire episode this week with bullshit. I think I've curated some of the best. So, first and foremost, the sign. Less than a day after <laughs> unilaterally declaring the website name and logo change, a crane was at Twitter headquarters taking down the old sign. Sadly, a permit did not manifest in less than 24 hours, so San Francisco police showed up and stopped the job, and as of this recording, the building still says err. Yeah, yeah. Well, that like ER is actually quite fitting because the whole company's on life support. So maybe that's why. Sure. Or, or maybe he's reconsidering like, oh, uh, wait, fuck, this was a really stupid idea, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, then there's the logo. As many of you may be aware, Musk crowdsourced the logo because <laughs> when you're a billionaire, you're a big fan of pluralism, apparently. Anyway, he the crowdsourced result... the letter X. <laughs> Yeah. the logo yeah uh okay. the result spoilers uh is a unicode x it's just <laughs> an x in unicode which is of course uncopyrightable and even if it were copyrightable meta and microsoft both already have copyrights on products called x and x japan is owned by a popular <laughs> j-rock group so not a good look no okay he named his website after the button for closing a tab on your browser for a website. <laughs> this is four-dimensional chess, I hope, for them. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, inside the building, the remaining employees were treated to the complete removal of all mentions of the old logo and title with the X 
being projected onto the inside walls of the building and meeting rooms renamed things like exposure and sexy spelled S3XY. Yeah, and inexplicable and quixotic and exasperating and toxic. (laughs) On the plus side, there are plenty of appropriate names. We can have all the meeting rooms he wants. Although... He's fired all the staff, so there's literally nobody to have meetings with anymore. <laughs> yeah. You said we need X employees. I don't understand what you're, what you're supposed to do. Now I know what you're thinking. Sure, Eli, those are the downsides, but what are the upsides? Well, I'll let Mr. Musk tell him himself. Quote, Twitter was acquired by X Corps, both to ensure freedom of speech and as an accelerant for X, the everything app. This is not simply a company renaming itself, but doing the same thing. The Twitter name made sense when it was just 140 character messages going back and forth like birds tweeting, but now you can post almost anything, including several hours of video. Yeah, yeah. So this, this, he's right. This isn't just a company rebranding and then doing the same thing. This is a company rebranding and then exploding in a fireball like a Tesla going over a fucking speed bump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He concluded the tweet by assuring users that X would be a place for, quote, comprehensive communications and the ability to conduct your entire financial world. <laughs> what? He concludes the Twitter name does not make sense in that context, so we must bid adieu to the bird, end quote. Yeah, cool. Yeah, finally, we have slur words and Tucker Carlson videos and crypto all together in one place. <laughs> It's like uh, the internet of the internet that he invented. Cool. I'm just going to switch over all my banking to that now. (laughs) One last thing about this story, and it's been pointed out online, but I just have to mention it. Elon Musk has been trying to make X a thing for literally his entire career, right? He started XSpace.com in 1999. His space company is called SpaceX. The Tesla model is Model X. He also named his son X. His AI company from last year is called XAI. His originally proposed name for PayPal, XPay. So yeah, all it took was $64 million, but he finally put his stupid name idea into the world for everyone to make fun of there you have it. <laughs> on threads <laughs> yeah. and in wooden dressed as scam news um, <laughs> that works if you're british trust me um here on the left of the political spectrum it's rare that we get to experience anything genuinely good or even like uncomplicatedly positive so instead we've got to follow the old german mantra of schadenfreude is your freunde um and <laughs> that's why this week the byline times uh, published the results of their three-year investigation into news ghoul and new zealand's answer to tucker carlson dan wooten okay <laughs> marsh put a picture into the notes of this guy he looks like he clearly just now took a shit and hit it somewhere and he <laughs> wants you to ask about it but you haven't yet so he has this dumb <laughs> smile like Come on. Where's yeah, that I shit? Mean, for those who aren't aware of Wooten, he's the former editor of the Sun newspaper, he's a columnist at the Daily Mail, and he's the We Can't Be Homophobic, one of our presenters is gay correspondent at GB News, the TV channel. Um, but Wooten has also been running something of a parallel media career, catfishing, tricking, and bribing unsuspecting men into sharing explicit sexual material with him. Which is weird, because I feel like the only way he could have success by propositioning men is if he was using his face as some kind of unregistered pepper spray collection device and then (laughs) was reselling the pepper spray. So I'm really interested to see how this went out. Mm. I'm looking at the picture that tracks. I really do want to wring out his face like a towel if I could. That would be something desirable to me now. So uh, according to this extensive investigation by Byline Times, Wooten posed as a fictitious showbiz agent to offer men £30,000 for sexually explicit photos and videos. And he was also bullying and sexually harassing a series of staffers at The Sun and then silencing victims with NDAs and large payouts. There's, there's even evidence that when The Sun won their libel case against Johnny Depp and they got a payout, Wooten used some of those funds to pay for a porn star to make him videos that he then used to catfish his victims. He even had The Sun's finance team set that porn star up as a payee on their system so he could misappropriate the funds that way. Because he was too cheap to pay for his own porn, even when he was going to use that porn as bait in a criminal enterprise. <laughs> wow. I mean, to be fair, that was probably the most responsible payout The Sun made all year. Like. <laughs> <laughs> 
and, and look, like all of this is sordid and squalid and sleazy, and it, but it, it wouldn't be a story worth discussing had Wooden not spent so much of his career gloating over the misdeeds and misfortunes of others in the public eye. So when the TV presenter Philip Schofield had an affair with a younger man, Wooten reveled in condemning him in the harshest terms. Um, Lily Allen, the pop star, she said the stress from being constantly bullied and surveilled by the sun was part of the reason that she'd end up getting blackout drunk, photos of which were then regularly on the front page of The Sun, Wooten's paper. Uh, Prince Harry sued Wooten over The Sun's harassing coverage of him and Meghan. I think that's still going through the court cases now. Um, Caroline Flack was a TV presenter who was charged with assault and she took her own life after being the subject of a constant stream of press coverage and surveillance, that charge being led in part by Dan Wooten. Her partner at the time would go on to serve time in prison for accusing Wooten of playing a role in her decision to kill herself and also for because uh, he accused Wooten of being, quote, a Harvey Weinstein level sex offender, which it turns out he basically was. Right, so... That guy gets released now, right? Because it turns out he was... I feel like that's got to be how it works if you're going to have those kind of libel and slander laws, right? Yeah, you'd hope that. He, he was sent down for the death threats that went along with it. So there's still some bad stuff that went on there. But he, but there's, he was right on some of the stuff there. But Wooten has presided over all of this from a lofty, moralising media high ground, expressing faux concern for the people involved while piling on the kind of attention and pressure and condemnation that is explicitly designed to make people crack. And he was doing that all the while, while he was carrying out a sleazy and grimy series of sex crimes himself. In fact, all of this, it only came to light after the BBC News presenter Hugh Edwards was found to be sexting a younger man, which Dan Wooten covered extensively and gleefully on his GB News show, the hypocrisy of which caused the dam to crack on his own grubby business, and all of that came flooding out. And he should have learned through all of this that if you live by the sword that you're plunging into other people's backs, you should probably make sure your own back isn't completely exposed. <laughs> yeah, good lesson. So, yeah, schadenfreude is your friend. Uh, is that, <laughs> yeah, is that is actually a German expression? No, I made that up. <laughs> okay. But I like it. I like it. It's a British expression, though. Yeah. Cool. And finally tonight, in Poopa Troopa News. <laughs> Mitch McConnell shat himself during a press conference. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And I mean, at best, he shat himself during a press conference. He was in the middle of a sentence and he just completely stopped talking and stood completely still, which is exactly what I might do if I shat myself on live television. That being said, it's also very possible that he suffered an episode related to a very serious medical condition. And that's not something to make light of. Yes, of fucking course it is. He is a <laughs> horrible, horrible person. Truly evil, horrible, one of the worst people in America. And everything bad that happens to him is great. Schadenfreude is your freunde. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Turns out I would wish it on my worst enemy. So, you know, learning's fun. We learn <laughs> Self-discovery. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure about the shitting. I was saying maybe it could be something else, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. The face of the guy standing behind Mitch McConnell at the press conference can only mean fuck he shot himself yeah it's up the back right like you like a fucking newborn he can see uh, it the, the best part of the clip is the handler who's trying to save it he like taps Mitch and he's like Mitch did you want to say anything else and Mitch looks at him like no man I just fucking shat myself like give me <laughs> ask oh, the guy Mitch. behind me <laughs> yeah. he'll tell you no I don't have anything left to say please drag me off slowly though slowly <laughs> slowly <laughs> Yeah. And on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to Michael Marshall. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets, like threads. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening. And please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like all the generous new donors, you will be complimented next time around. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, d and Minus, and Citation Needed, available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off.
Hey Heath, who's trying to light Shut up, up I'm doing a five right count. Shut, <laughs> Let's, up. Shut, shut up. Start just saying numbers, Eli. One, four, <laughs> seven, two, five, four, three, five, four, 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 five, four, five, four. God damn it. <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved.